All right, thanks everyone. I'm Fred Rice, and I'm here with my colleague, Vijay Bomaredipali. And we're going to talk to you today about bringing an AI ecosystem to the domain expert and the enterprise AI developer. Both of us hail from. I think sadly, it might. Both of us come from the Center for Open Source Data and AI Technologies down the street at 505 Howard Street. And Vijay is going to start out by telling you a bit more about the center, and then we'll get into the core of our talk about the AI ecosystem and deep learning for the enterprise. Cool. Well, before, before I tell you a little bit about the center, I thought you know, the center's name incorporates both open source and AI, so I thought I'd tell you a little bit about what IBM does in this space. And then when I thought, what's the best way to say that, I went back a little bit in time. So I thought I'd start off with an interesting bit of trivia. So I don't know how many of you know this timeless classic, 2001 Space Odyssey. Stanley Kubrick, yep, yeah, a lot of sci-fi fans, right? So we, um, IBM was a technical advisor, who knew, right? And uh, recently in a documentary, it turns out Stanley Kubrick was asking, hey, you know, do they know that this is about a psychotic computer? <laughs> you know, and, and the, the production guy said, uh, yeah, the producer said, yeah, they do, as long as their products are not associated with it, it's, it's all good. <laughs> so... Fast forward to 97, uh, you know, Deep Blue famously beat Gary Kasparov, right, in chess. Um, and uh, Gary Kasparov now speaks at IBM events, right? And he said, like, you know, if you can't beat him, join him, right? Um, fast forward to 2011, and IBM, again, one of our research grand challenges was to create a, a machine that would beat the winningest Jeopardy players, right? Everyone know Jeopardy, you know? The, the correct answer is, what is Jeopardy, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, and, you know, after that, things it went into warp speed, right? Especially on the open source side. And, you know, a whole bunch of open source projects came, came into play, right? Google released Go. And, and a lot of things have happened. And, you know, IBM's very much right in the center of this, right? And one of the things that we do, I keep going in the wrong direction, um, is we, we create centers wherever a technology is so foundational, so important for us, we create technology centers, right? We started all the way back with the Linux Technology Center. We created the Java Technology Center. We created the Spark Technology Center. And, you know, over time, we became a bit of a misnomer with the Spark Technology Center. So that's what the team was known as, the Spark Technology Center, right? And the reason we became a misnomer is because the team expanded way beyond Apache Spark and the ecosystem around Apache Spark. Right, so we recently relaunched, uh, we call ourselves Code. Code is a French word, any French speaking people here, no? I always like to, to validate you know, whether my pronunciation is completely off, right? So Code stands for coder, right, and, or has coded, and we let our code do the talking, so that's why you know, we, we like that acronym. Um, and the team has been very active out in the community, right? Right from our launch in 2015, we've been actively contributing into Apache Spark itself. Uh, actually, those numbers, I, I didn't get a chance to update it. We're close to about 996 JIRA, so we're about four shy of 1,000 JIRAs contributed into Apache Spark itself. So a whole lot of code has gone into Apache Spark, right, from our team. But in addition to that, we have about 15 different open source projects, including TensorFlow, Keras, that we contribute to. And the reason we do that is two things, right? One is IBM's always been a fantastic citizen in, in open source. And I call the, I, I'm a relatively new entrant in the open source world of IBM, but I mean, I'm calling back to the legacy of IBM all the way from the Linux days into Java. We're constantly contributing into open source, including the Eclipse project, which originated at IBM, right? So we are continuing our work. We're part of a much larger open source organization within IBM. And our current focus is on AI. Right? Um, we have not abandoned our Spark mission by any stretch of the imagination. Meme, who's there taking a picture right now, um, you know, she leads our Spark team, and we have a much more expanded mission, and, and, and we're continuing our, our work in there. The reason I mention that is, any of you would like to co uh, collaborate in open source, please reach out to me. Every piece of work that we do is out in the open. Right? So we'd like to kind of really, and, and Fred will talk about one of our main projects as part of that. Within IBM, Spark is really, really important to us. Over 25 different product lines, and I'm not talking about the number of solutions that be, are built on top of Spark, but major product lines are built entirely on top of Apache Spark and, and, and the things that we need around it, like the Jupyter Enterprise Gateway and other projects, right? 
Uh, and my team members are out there. Nick Pentreath, who's one of the speakers here uh, at three different sessions. Uh, that's him in the bottom right. We are you know, out there um, around the world talking about some of the projects that we're doing. Right? Um, and very briefly, what we focus on is like code, content, and community. Right? So if you go to IBM Code, right, all our content is out there. Our GitHubs are out there. Uh, you can go to codate.org. And, and you know, we, we have everything out in the open. Um, on the bottom right over there, you will see the areas of our focus. Right? We're looking at the Jupyter ecosystem and things that need to be done for enterprise uh, usage of Jupyter. So things like you know, um, uh, resource optimization. How do you make sure your kernels are distributed across the cluster as opposed to being bottlenecked on one node? in the cluster, right? How do you make sure you user impersonation, how, how a user ID is passed all the way through from the notebook all the way back to the cluster, right? Um, Pandas, the scikit-learn ecosystem. Uh, I just mentioned our, some of the, our, our stellar contributions on Spark. We just got started with Keras and TensorFlow. We've been doing some projects for a couple of years, but we just started contributing to the core frameworks themselves. Um, we're going to talk a lot about the model asset exchange and show a demo of what we're doing over there with regards to deep learning models. Right? Uh, we also launched something called Fabric for Deep Learning, right, which is our open source platform for doing deep learning across all the way from training and, and monitoring, right? And, and we're going to slowly add other pieces of that puzzle over there as well. These are the projects. Go to codate.org. I'm not going to go through this project in detail. Fabric for Deep Learning is something we're spending a tremendous amount of energy in, right? This is the backbone behind the Watson machine learning or the Watson deep learning as a service, right? And we've open sourced that entire backbone, right? We are pretty much... Uh, you know, uh, this particular project supports TensorFlow, Keras, Cafe, PyTorch, over five or six, uh, I think last I checked, there's six now, mm -hmm. right? Six different frameworks that we support through this fabric for deep learning. And through this, we give a consistent way to kind of do training, deploying, and visualizing of your deep learning jobs, right? And all of it is built on top of a Kubernetes infrastructure. Right, so I highly recommend that you check this project out. I briefly mentioned about Jupyter Enterprise Gateway, another cool, pro another cool project. We invite contributions on that one as well, so please do join that project. And with that, I'll turn it over to Fred. So we have a lot of material to cover, so I apologize for rushing through this, but uh, reach out to me. I'll be in the back, and well, we can discuss more. All right, thanks, Vijay, for setting the stage. Now, for the remaining uh, 21 minutes, we're going to talk about deep learning, and in particular about the IBM Code Model Asset Exchange, which is one of the projects that we run out of the Center for Open Source Data and AI Technologies. So you may have seen this uh, chart earlier in one of Vijay's slides down towards the bottom. Here we've got it blown up. This shows all of the different projects that we work on, all the different open source technologies that we work on inside Codate. And today I'm going to be talking to you about the Model Asset Exchange, which is down here supporting deep learning. Now, across all of these projects, our mission in contributing these, to these projects is to accelerate the broad adoption of AI across the enterprise. And what I mean by that is we want to make AI a ubiquitous feature of doing business in the modern world. And the, the level of ubiquity we want to aim for is we want to make AI be like having a telephone. We want it to be as ubiquitous as the telephone as a way of doing business. Now at IBM, we use telephones a lot. We're a multinational company. We have telephones in every office. Every employee knows how to use the telephone, but we're not a phone company. So if we're going to make AI to that level of ubiquity, we need to get to a point where you can use AI in all aspects of your business without being an AI company. And so today we're going to talk about how do we enable domain experts who don't work on AI, who work on their domain, be it whatever is the core of their business, how do we enable these domain experts to effectively use deep learning in the enterprise? Now, uh, to get into that topic, I think we'll need to first answer one question, which is, what is deep learning? Fortunately, that has an easy answer. Uh, it's just machine learning using deep learning neural networks. Of course, that brings up another question that we'll need to answer. So what's a deep neural network? That's easy to answer. It's a neural network with multiple hidden layers, um, which, of course, raises one more question. What is a neural network? So we're going to go through this and teach you just enough about deep learning so that we can pop back up that stack and get through the rest of this talk. 
So how many people are intimately familiar with deep learning already? So a couple of you. So hold on, this will be over pretty quickly. For the rest mm -hmm. of you, you're going to learn just enough about deep learning to understand the rest of this talk. So what is a, deep, what is a neural network? A neural network is at its core built on top of many instances of linear regression. So you have, you're trying to predict a variable y based on some inputs, x1, x2, and x3. You learn some coefficients, a, b, and c, such that if you multiply those by your inputs, you get a predicted value for y. This is what linear regression looks like as an equation. You can also think of it as a graph, where every variable input and output is a, is a node, and all the coefficients are edges. And once you start thinking about these things as graphs, you can think of a bunch of linear regressions stacked on top of each other as a more complex graph. And you can think of adding another layer to this graph. Now we have two layers of linear regressions, lots of coefficients driving the relationships between these variables, and this is what is called a multilayer perceptron neural networks. So neural networks are graphs of basically linear regressions that are built up in this way. Now you can see we already have, even though this is a simple network, we have a lot of noise on the screen, so typically these are drawn by collapsing down each layer into a single box and collapsing down that rat's nest of arrows into a single arrow. So the, the network on the left is the same as the one on the right. So that's neural networks in two minutes. So what's a deep neural network? A deep neural network is a neural network there are, where there are multiple hidden layers. In our example, we had one hidden layer, one layer that's not directly connected to the input or the output. If we have a couple of them, now we have a deep neural network. Uh, we have a, something of a toy deep neural network. Real deep neural networks look something like this. And so when we use these neural networks to do machine learning, we're doing deep learning. Deep learning is machine learning using a deep neural network. And typically, this is a medium-sized network on the left. Each of those boxes is a couple hundred instances of linear regression. So why do we care about deep learning? Well, the primary reason and the primary characteristic that people know about with deep learning is that it gives these state-of-the-art results across a wide variety of different domains ranging from images to text to time series, many different domains, the current best result that's available in research comes via deep learning. And you can, this is a dump of one day's headlines about deep learning. It is, these results just keep on coming. However, there, there are a couple other characteristics of deep learning that become very relevant when you want to apply this state-of-the-art technology in the enterprise. The first is that these models, as I was mentioning, to be effective, need to be very large and very complex. Here's our Inception v3 model from before. Every one of those little tiny boxes is anywhere from 32 to 768 instances of linear regression. There are literally hundreds of millions of parameters to this model. As a result of this size and complexity, these models are pretty poorly understanding, understood today. Our understanding that we have of deep learning is effectively empirical and subjective. We know that there exist models that worked on particular problems on particular data sets. We know anecdotally that there also exist combinations of models, problems, and data sets that didn't work, but we don't know what those are because those results are not publishable. So we have a lot of point results, but when it comes to explaining why these things work in such a way that we can take the risk out of deploying this technology from scratch, we're not quite there yet. So here's an illustrative example. Here we have a paper that uh, for a couple weeks had the record on a common uh, benchmark image classification task. In the conclusion that I've uh, pulled out here, there's this sentence down here. While these results are encouraging, questions remain on the exact dynamics at play. Or to put it more briefly, we took an existing model, we changed something, it worked better, and we have no idea why. This is, is a very common thing. And so when we come back to the enterprise and we want to make AI, we want to make deep learning act like a telephone where it's ubiquitous and people who are not world-renowned experts can pick it up and use it, we need to step back a bit and maybe ratchet down the complexity of the task that we're focusing on. So for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to talk about a simpler way to use deep learning. We're going to talk about incorporating already well-understood deep learning models into existing or new enterprise applications. Now, your first reaction here might be, have we ratcheted down the simplicity too much? 
That sounds kind of easy, right? They're well understood problems, they're considered solved. Uh, actually, that's not quite the case. If you look at a deep learning model, at the core, there's that neural network. But that neural network, it's just a graph. It's not going to solve any business problems for you by itself. To use that graph, you need two other components. First of all, you need some weights to parameterize this graph, typically a couple hundred million weights. So the, the boxes, imagine that the boxes are much, much bigger than they really are on the screen. And even now, at this point, we've got a, a graph and some weights. This is all just data. It can't perform any actions. So we need a computer program that's going to perform actions using these parameters. And that program needs to do a lot of things. It needs to take an input. It needs to transform that input into a form that the graph can take in as, and maybe even transform it into multiple instances. It needs to run it through the graph. It needs to get the result back. It needs to transform the result back into a format that the application can use and return the result. And this all needs to fit into your application framework. So you need these three parts. They're all quite complex to get it. Here's a quick example of what this looks like in practice. Let's say you want to do the most well understood, most home run use case for deep learning. You want an image classifier. Well, the first thing you'll need to do is to assemble those three components, the graph, the weights, and the program. Let's start with the graph. There are about 100 different convolutional neural nets in use for image classification, in common use for image classification, and you need to pick one as your first step. That means reading some papers, quite a few papers. At the very least, you'll need to read this paper, and this paper, and this paper, and this paper, and this paper. Then you'll have a rough idea. Then you need to find code for your neural network. This is the code for the ResNet 50 that generates the graph for ResNet 50 on TensorFlow. As you can see, it's somewhat non-trivial. Uh, not only is there quite a bit of it, it's quite difficult to understand. But you need to get that and pull it into your source control and build up your own understanding of it. Now you have one component of your solution. You have the graph. You'll need some weights, some parameters to run that graph. And those come, are hidden off in a different part of the internet because these weights files are huge. In this example, we have a 122 megabyte weights file that they've shoehorned into Git large file storage. So you could take this weights file, well, but then you'd find it doesn't work because this one's for a CAFE2 model and that model on the previous page is a different model. So you need to find one that's exactly matched with your model. But once you've gotten that all together, then you need a program, a driver program that these two components can sit in. And typically what you will find is a driver program that's not meant for inference, but that is meant for training and bulk scoring. That's what we've got here, the driver program that can, comes with those, that graph program that I showed you earlier. So what you need to do at this point is you need to use this program as an example, and you've got to write your own code that's going to score the model for the purposes of running it within an application, say one image at a time, or if you want to get uh, human level performance, multiple crops of that same image at a time, then you've got to package it, put it into your infrastructure, get it all working, deploy the package, and, and that's quite a bit of work. Uh, so fortunately, there are model marketplaces. What model marketplaces are, these are collections of these well understood deep learning models, but they come packaged in such a way that you can consume them in a much more direct way without having to run all over the internet and run all over your library trying to figure out how things work. And today we're going to be talking about IBM's open source model marketplace, which is the IBM Code Model Asset Exchange. This is a place where we keep a lot of free open source models, deep learning models from a wide variety of domains. We are framework agnostic, so we pick the best of breed for across multiple dif different deep learning framework. We have vetted and tested all of the code and IP that goes in here. And the, the, the upshot of this is you can pick a model out of here and get running with that model in a web application in about 30 seconds. You can also, for the models that we've made trainable, start training them on Watson Studio with GPU acceleration for free in about five minutes. So I'm going to, the best way to show this is with the demo. So I'm going to do a quick demo here. And bear with me for just a second. So the model asset exchange is to be found on our website, which looked much bigger this morning. Let me make that bigger for you. There we go. So I think I made it too big. Okay, so on IBM code, which is 
developer.ibm.com, we have a section called the Model Asset Exchange. In this demo scenario, I'm going to pretend that I work for a startup that's running a, a social network for amateur sports photographers. I've got my, my clients, my customers, they all are uploading hundreds of images a day. They all look kind of like this, you know, they come in with pictures of various sports events. I want them to be able to socialize doing this. With just this image in hand and you know, the, the number that the camera spit out, all I can do is display the image. I want to do more. I want to be able to search the images. I want to be able to suggest the images. Well, there are neural network models. There are deep learning models that can help with that. And one of those models happens to be a model that we have here on the IBM Code Model Asset Exchange. It's an image caption generator. What this model does is it takes an image as input, it understands what's going on in the image, and it generates an English language description of what is happening. When we have that English language text in hand, we can do a lot more in the context of an application. So if I want to get this model in a consumable format, all I need to do is click on that get that's model link. Network's a little flaky, so I'll just show you where that takes you. Uh, so it takes you to a GitHub page with the GitHub repository where we have prepackaged this model in a format where you can very, very quickly stand it up. I'm going to risk a Git clone here. So we can do this basically from scratch on the screen as you. So step one is to clone the repository. Step two is to go into the readme and copy the, the uh, command to build the container. Uh, sorry, we need to go into, there we are. And step three is to deploy the container. And now you can see in about 30 seconds, I've got to a point where I have a model wrapped up in a web service that I've deployed on my laptop. I could obviously deploy this on the cloud anywhere that's got Kubernetes or Docker. And it's r running on a local port. And I can go to that local port. And Now it's running on that local port, and I can go there. And you can see it's already put up an API that as an application developer, I can understand this. I just need to send this kind of JSON message to it. There's even a button where I can test this out. Uh, and what we've done with this model in particular is we've wrapped it up in what we call a code pattern. So uh, on IBM Code, if I go back to my... On IBM Code, we have these code patterns, which are instructions with code on GitHub to show you how to cover different use cases. We are working on one that involves a demonstration of what you can do with this. And remember, the scenario here is I've got a lot of images. I need to be able to generate metadata for them. And in this example, which I've got running here, we built a small application that takes a corpus of images. And on the left-hand side, you can select images or you can take a look at them. And you can see we've run these images through that model. And in fact, if I were to upload some additional images, they get run through the model on the fly. And that model gives us a sentence to describe each image. And if I select those, now I can use the words in that sentence to build a word cloud. So now, now I can start to navigate these images where I, before I could just display them. So we're already getting value out of this deep learning model, even though we've only been you know, working on this for five minutes. So this shows you how the model asset exchange can accelerate being able to use these deep learning models in the enterprise without having to worry about finding good reference implementations of all those different pieces and assembling them yourselves because we create this one place where we put everything and we've already vetted it for quality, we've already vetted it for IP, and it just, it just works. The other thing I should note is for other models on there, for example, this one, uh, we make them trainable so that you can bring your own data, because in some cases it makes sense not to use a reference training set, but to use a custom training set. And when we make things trainable, it's trainable basically in a couple steps on the IBM Cloud in the free tier. So let's go back to the presentation and just summarize what I was saying. So the IBM Code Model Asset Exchange is our online exchange for free open source deep learning models. We cover models from a wide variety of domains, uh, images, as you saw, natural languages, as you saw. We also have other NLP models. We're working on some time series ones, some sound ones. We cover multiple deep learning frameworks so that we can pick the best of breed model that's available for each category. 
We've also carefully vetted all the code and IP, so when you get something from Model Asset Exchange, you can know that it's going to work, and it's going to protect you from, any, from getting sued, basically. And um, as you've seen, we can build and deploy a web application out of the Model Asset Exchange in about 30 seconds, and you can even start training your own custom models on Watson Studio in a couple minutes. As we move forward with this uh, repository, with this exchange, we're going to be adding more models. We have an, another batch of models in the pipeline that should be released soon. We're going to have more deployment options. We'll be uh, revamping the website with some additional buttons that you can click to deploy automatically to various cloud environments. And we're also creating code patterns, like the one you just saw as a draft, that show how to use these models and give you a skeleton of an application for various ways to use these models end to end. So thank you very much for coming to our talk. Yeah, you can go to the next slide. Um, but wait, there's more. <laughs> so yeah, one last housekeeping thing. So very quick, one initiative that I wanted to talk about. Uh, IBM launched something called Call, Call for Code. This is about creating disaster, you know, disaster uh, mitigation solutions using some of our technologies. So do go to the Call for Code website. Um, there's a good chunk of money in terms of prize. There's a $200,000 uh, prize for the winning solution. Right? And the reason I wanted to mention this in this context is as you're looking at some of the deep learning models on the model asset exchange, as, as Fred mentioned, these are things that we've vetted to make sure they can be usable in the enterprise. Right? We want to make sure that they license associated with that. All of these things, usually things that we don't care about until you get a call from your lawyer. Right? I think you know, we want to make sure that this is something that was vetted. And you know, specifically around the call for code, we wanted to make sure that we're able to leverage some of these models, right, and some of the technologies that are available for you and, and be able to use that. And for this, I mean, there's a tremendous amount of effort that has gone in, right? IBM's investing a lot, and we've jointly partnered with, uh, with the International Red Cross, the, the UNHCR. Um, we're also partnering with the Linux Foundation on this, right? So they are gonna give us support, um, give the solutions support in terms of the open source uh, uh, portions of it, right? And they're also going to, uh, you know, uh, people will have access to VCs so that you can actually go approach and ask them for funding to make this a full-blown solution, right? And more importantly, I've got t-shirts here. So if anyone wants t-shirts, you're welcome to grab a few over here. Very limited supply, so anyone who has good questions, we'll, we'll pass them on to you. So, but, but yeah, do try out IBM Code. Go to the IBM Code site or go to codate.org, C-O-D-A-I-T.org, and check out some of the projects. As I mentioned, everything that we've done is out in open source, and Fred and I are available here for any questions. Thanks, Vijay. So yes, call for code. If you want to find the website, look on the back of our t-shirts. Um, <laughs> one other thing to note is this is the 11th and final IBM session at this year's Spark Summit. So we encourage you to take a look at the replays of the other IBM sessions when they come up. IBM has done a lot with Apache Spark, and we continue to innovate in both Spark and AI. Uh, so thanks again for coming. Uh, we are at codate.org, and our LinkedIn's are down there if you want to reach out to us. Otherwise, we have about a minute and 19 seconds for questions. <laughs> Awesome, thank you. Um, so if anyone has questions, just raise your hand and I'll come by. In your example on image recognition, uh, is it, do you have ability to actually retrain your model if you submit your own images, kind of domain-specific images, mm -hmm. to take advantage? Because, because what we're running is just we're serving the model. Right. So, so that particular model that I showed, the image cla caption generator, is very, very time-consuming to train. So we haven't made that trainable simply because you would not be able to train it on the free tier of Watson Studio. Uh, and in fact, it would take you a very long time to train your own copy. And also, the you know, building up the training data itself is very expensive. So that's a, an example of a case where if you're going to use the model in an enterprise setting, unless you work for an AI company, what you want to do is consume a reference version of it, like we have on the Model Asset Exchange, as is. Yeah, that now wasn't a classifier. Yeah. That was the image yeah. caption, but we do have classifiers. We have classifiers. Now, for image classification, you do want to make it retrainable. And IBM actually has a, a, a for-pay offering with a substantial free tier, though, that's called IBM Watson Visual Recognition, where you can upload your own set of images, 
and it will use transfer learning from a model that's pre-trained on a large data set to automatically train mm -hmm. a new model, a new deep learning model that we'll recognize within your domain. And we have a lot of examples of IBM clients who have used that to really accelerate uh, the time to value on a lot of interesting use cases like inspecting uh, cell phone tower, uh, sorry, electrical towers for rust from drones, for example. Uh, and looking for water on, in farming, so really interesting. Yeah, and, even and like there's some really cool use yeah. cases like uh, windmill damage, right? So yeah. they take high-speed photos of windmill in action. Previously, they had to shut down these multi-hundred megawatt windmills uh, for, for days at a time while someone climbs up, whereas now these cameras take high-resolution images while these, uh, and filter out the, the, the ones where there are no blades and be able to apply those visual recognition, as, as Fred mentioned, yep. and be able to classify them very quickly on the fly. And, uh, other question. Uh, what do you use for source for your training? Is it ImageNet or it's your secret source? <laughs> <laughs> all the models are open source. So they're all, in general, trained on publicly available data. Where the, data, where the licensing terms on the data set allow us to redistribute them, we are redistributing them. In some cases, ImageNet being the prime example, we can't really distribute ImageNet because that is all copyrighted. But what we can do is we can distribute an artifact that was trained on ImageNet. That's what Watch and Visual Recognition is doing internally. They're using ImageNet plus a bunch of additional data that we've collected to train the base model, and then you bring your own data to do the transfer learning. Awesome. Uh, so that's all the time that we have for questions right now. But if you have more questions, feel free to come up afterwards and talk to the speakers in person. So uh, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.